I don't care how many people show up. I'm just glad you're here today. I just know that it's um, life has not been really easy as a teacher. I definitely feel it. Um, I was listening to the news and they said, you know, this is the third academic year that's been touched by COVID. And I don't know why when they said that, that just kind of like made me feel better because my experience is not, it hasn't been 18 months. It's disrupted year over year over year and it's it's really changed our practice it's changed how i feel it's changed the energy level at school you know even simple things like well not simple things but te parent teacher conferences oh my god what a drama is it in person is it on phone like you know there's just so many things do i do scholastic do i not i chose not to by the way because i'm just there's only so many things i can do and i just think as setting boundaries is a really important thing so today's topic, uh, I just really wanted to kind of touch over more of what they call an informal practice, um, because sometimes people really think that, that meditation is the only way to get there. Stress management is an ongoing moment by moment thing, and some people don't find success with meditation. I think where I found the biggest area of growth for me is the informal practice, that moment to moment mindfulness, that that paying attention to what's happening in our own minds. And so I just wanted to address a little bit for me what happens is so this is my cycle. Um, when somebody criticizes me or I feel shame because I don't like shame, it's not really my gem. <laughs> who is? So what happens is when I get criticized, I have this fight, flight, or freeze response. And I didn't quite realize what I was doing. What I was doing is in my brain, I would get so angry and I would be like, well, they don't know what they're talking about. And I don't know. Nah, 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 nah. And I would have this very negative self-talk that would go and it would just, it would layer on top of my difficulty and my shame. Or um, if, so my biggest trigger for me is if something's unfair like that, if you want to freak me right out, like throw in some machismo and like some seriously unfair women stuff, throw in some, you know what I mean? Like that just, I just lose it. Or if I'm in a meeting and somebody talks over me and I clearly know it's because I'm a female, I feel so upset, but I don't say it out of my mouth. I say it in my own head. Well, don't they know I did this and da, 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 da. And so what I realized through my informal practice is I spoke to myself so poorly and it was also um, a place of rage for me. And so in my practice called self-compassion, we talk often about shame to blame. And that was something I did all the time. So if I felt embarrassed, I would be like Burr, in here and then I'd be like, make it your fault. My principal, he's such a this and, and I can't believe that teacher did this. And, and so I was always having this, what they call the war with reality. And that was always a, a difficult place for me to be in. And it, and it compounded my difficulty, didn't alleviate it. Um, and so it felt like I was stuck in this record and I would just play these records. I'd be like, oh, greatest hits, anger, super. I'm just going to play that one or, oh, stress, overwhelmed, or whatever you want your record to uh, call. Um, I suffered really badly with an anxiety disorder and uh, definitely had my <laughs> my fair share of, of panic attacks. And I just really like to talk about that because I think it's the elephant often in the room and that anxiety and depression are often um, ugly twin sisters and they go together, unfortunately. And um, I was a yoga instructor for more than 20 years and I still teach yoga and I found it helpful. Um, but it wasn't until I found something called mindful self-compassion did I really feel uh, real strategies for me and um, a noticeable effect in my mind and my sleep and all the things that go around it. Uh, so I, I don't know where your um, level of knowledge around the, around mindful self-compassion is. As I'll just give you a bit of background. It's an international program. It's been uh, the first research studies around mindful self-compassion was done by Kristen Neff. Um, and she did them and published them um, in 2001. And today there's like over more than 4,000 studies on self-compassion. But basically self-compassion is the idea is, do you treat yourself like an ally or uh, like a friend? Or do you say super negative things to yourself? Are you an inner critic? Or are you an inner ally? Um, so that's the first part. And do you speak to yourself with kindness? Second part, you know, mindfulness, knowing what you're feeling when you're feeling it. 
So that's the third part or second part. And the third part of it is, um, is something called common humanity. Sometimes we feel like we're the only person on the face of the earth who feels this distinct, like, uh, flavor of suffering, right? I'm the only person who feels overwhelmed. I'm the only person who can't um, get their laundry on top of it. And I'm whatever, whatever your record that you're playing, you're not enoughness record or that like why me record. And sometimes you forget. So the example I give with common humanity, just to make it sit a little bit with you, is that there are something like 18 million people who have the date of your birth, like 18 million. Imagine. So how many people feel what you feel in this moment? How many people feel overwhelmed or are having a hard time at school or struggling with something at home or marriage issue or whatever it is? Like, take a minute and be like, I am so not alone in my difficulty because, you know, this is part of the human experience. And sometimes we forget and we just think that we're, we're alone in, in this pain. So those are the three parts. And um, Mindful Self-Compassion is an international program. Like I said, there's courses online, um, there's books, there's workshops. You can just basically look it up. It's called MSC. And um, several years ago, I took the course. I took it twice, uh, even after 20. <laughs> at that point, I'd done like 15 years of yoga. And I, I still took it twice. I found the concepts to be revolutionary. Um, in the big long course, like in the eight-week course, you, something, you learn something like 20 different um, strategies. I, I became trained in it. Like just to give you an, this is the size of the manual. Um, we're going to do one of the exercises today, but where my focus really lays is I, um, I hang out with teens. I hang out with teenagers and I teach them mindful self-compassion because I can't watch another uh, teenager have a panic attack in my library. It's just too hard to watch. So I wanted to be proactive and I got myself trained. Uh, and now I work for the center, which I'm really excited about. And I uh, train teachers to train uh, to be teachers for kids. So I'm what they call a teacher trainer and I now work for the center. So I know this stuff inside and out. Open your mics at any point if you have a question, like I, I, you won't throw me off my game. I This is my jam and I, I live and breathe this stuff. Okay. Can I ask a question? Of course. That's what I'm like. I gave a really loose. I want it to be useful. Um, so I love mindful self-compassion. I've yeah. taken the MBSR course, but I haven't had a chance to take the MSC course. I was mm -hmm. supposed to take it right before COVID hit and then it got yeah. canceled. I was to come to the island to take it. I'm just going to stop you one second. So she's talking about MBSR. This is mindful based stress reduction. They're similar. So that's more of a mindfulness program. And then self-compassion has mindfulness in it, but it really is different in flavor and touch. So uh, a lot of people who do MBSR, they've moved over to like the head of the center used to do MBSR, right? So it, it, it's it's very different. When Once you go self-compassion, you don't go back. Please continue your question. Exactly. Which is why I want to take the MSC course because I wanted to um, get trained to teach it because I was like, mm -hmm. this is amazing. I read yep. the book and immersed myself in what I could find online. But do you have to take the MSC course to take the Making Friends with Yourself course to teach it to teach? No. Yes. Okay. No. You know what? I'm going to have to ask Steve on that. I Because I the... So basically the first tra uh, teacher trainer is starting to happen in March. Um, and I haven't seen what the requirements are. Like we're still working on the, the teaching guide. Um, so I, when I got accepted, I can just say I had to take the MSC course, um, which I did. And I, to be honest, I've taken it at this point three times <laughs> because it like, it's like an onion. There's just so many freaking layers. And then I think I understand it. And then I'm like, oh. There's more. Uh, and then I just, as a sidebar, if you wanted to read Kristen Neff's new book, it's one of the things I'm going to talk about is fierce compassion. There's a whole other layer there that's incredible. So today I'm going to specifically yeah. talk about the yin yang part um, and the fierce compassion part with the mm -hmm. with her new book release. I'm reading her new book right now. That's oh, awesome. yeah. Yeah, it's hard to, I'm in Alberta and there's no in-person yep. courses here. So I kept just trying to go to BC and getting shut down. So hopefully- You soon. know what? 
Um, I'm going to be totally honest. My good, my teacher, um, her name is uh, Victoria Pavlovsky, um, and she was my teacher. She's absolutely incredible. She's just been such a mentor to me in my life. Um, she's teaching a course, a short course. Actually, you know what? I'll put it in the link in a second. She's teaching a short course, and the short course costs two twenty six. It's way cheaper than the, the long course, and our pro D covers it. Like our and our union covers it as a pro D fund because it is so effective and it's statistically valid. Um, and t like tons of our teachers in our district have taken it because we're supported with it, right? And it, it's valid. Thank okay. you. She was supposed to be my teacher at the course that I was going to go to. Oh my so God. Okay. So she that. is totally incredible. She's gone to Africa. Um, what is her thing? Compassion inspired. I'm going to put it in the chat as I talk to you. Um, she's gone to Africa and, um, uh, she's that like help people in war torn countries and women. So cool. Anyway, I just find this okay, stuff really cool. Sorry for uh, no over here. <laughs> I was gonna say people. I I'm, we're gonna get into practice, but so I'm like, if anyone else wants to ask more questions, you're welcome to. But I'm gonna put my teacher up in the chat. Um, but if you go on the center's website, there's tons on there. Um, but she's just lovely, and so she's on Monday nights. Um, and she does it through Zoom. So, workshops, calendar. Okay, perfect. Dun, 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 dun. Workshops. And the next one's starting here. Where's that one? November 1st. So perfect timing. Okay. And copy. Okay. So my teacher's in the chat if you wanted to add, but then you can also go to the center. There's tons if that time doesn't work for you. Okay, any other questions before I get into the, the nitties? No, okay, I'm gonna keep going. All right, let me just get my slide deck up. Um, and again, I'm just gonna copy the link for my slide deck. There's not that much in it. Maybe you'll grab the quotes in there that you may like, but uh, there's not that many links, but that's my slide deck if you wanna follow along at home. And here I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, share. Okay, then. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, um, so I just, I already covered this. I always seem to forget that I work for the center. So I just talk about it. Okay. So to me, the most important thing is when things go sideways is something called radical acceptance. The first person who really talked about this was a woman called Tara Brack. And I'm not talking about like laying down and saying, oh, this is happening. I'm just going to like let this roll over me. No, that's not what we're talking about. Radical acceptance is sometimes we fight against things that we cannot change. And this is, again, what they call the war of reality. So I'm just going to read this quote out because when I read this quote the first time, I like felt like someone punched me in the gut. So it goes like this. Through practice, I've come to see that the deepest source of my misery is not wanting things to be the way they are, not wanting myself to be the way I am, not wanting the world to be the way it is, not wanting others to be the way they are. And when I'm suffering, I find it's the war of reality to be the heart of the problem. God, it's a quote. It's so good. Um, and I, I love this because sometimes we forget that there's stuff that we can't do and we can't fix. And so how do I be compassionate to myself? How do, be, how do I be well in a very difficult situation? I'm sure all of you have had a bad boss at some point in your life, and it makes your life really, really hard, and you can't structurally change it. So then you have to ask yourself, what do I need in this moment? Um, Kristen Neff just came out with this new book called Fierce Self-Compassion, and she says that there are two sides to being well, and we're talking about the informal practice here today. And she calls the yang uh, self-compassion is the acting, the action version. So maybe you have a bad boss. Well, do you need to quit? Do you need to ask your union for support? Do you need to take time off? So what actions do you need to make sure that you have boundaries and that you're healthy and those kinds of things? But then 
those situations are really, really hard on your system, on your body. So then you need to take care of yourself. You need to soothe the nervous system and allow the nervous system and the somatic experience to relax. So this is the soft side. So that's why they call it fierce self-compassion or yin and yang. So there's two sides of this to be really well. Um, so the yin self-compassion um, really is the important is, is the being part, is trying to be at, with our our pain in a compassionate way. It's comforting, it's reassuring, it's validating. So, you know, when I heard that this is our third academic year that been touched by COVID, like it was really validating. And sometimes, you know, we just need someone to be like, yeah, yeah, that sucks, that hurts. And often we think that um, when we're self-compassionate to ourselves, often people will say, well, this is selfish. No, you can't cannot pour from an empty cup. If you don't take care of yourself, then there's, you can't read people. There's not enough space for other people. Um, the research shows very clearly that people who are self-compassionate are more connections. They have deeper and more loving relationships. Um, they have a greater circle of friends. They have less shame in their life. Like it goes on and on and on. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of people will say, well, if I do yin all the time, I'm just going to nap all the time. I'm not going to get anything done. Funny enough, the research shows that if you give yourself the permission to nap, you will have more energy later to do the things you actually want to do. So the research again shows that being soft and kind to yourself um, actually increases your motivation. You're more willing to risk because you could pick yourself off off the floor. You're more willing to try new things. And so to me, this is a really powerful um, set, a source for me of courage um, and resiliency when things have been really difficult in the last little bit. Um, so again, you need both sides of compassion to be really well. These two aspects are very different, but equal, essentially all ways of caring. So MSC includes both of these, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and before we can step up with world with courage and strength, we both need yin and yang and daily living. And so this is my favorite quote, and it's from Joan Halifax. You need to have a strong back, soft front. And can you imagine work walking through the world with that, a soft back, soft front? Um, and I also think as women, uh, sometimes we don't speak up our truth um, and we don't speak up for what we want. So I just really like that analogy. I'm going to stick up for myself, but I'm going to take care of myself at the same time. Um, and, you know, I'll give you an example. One of the things during COVID, we had to make a, a COVID plan. And I just said, I'm not doing book exchanges. I'm not pushing a cart because my body is just not capable. And I was just really proud of myself that I was, stand, I was able to stand up and just be like, this is what what I need, what the students need. And sometimes that's not always going to get um, you favors. <laughs> not everyone's going to like the fierce side of you, but you are. When you say no to others, it's a yes to you. Okay, so I'm just going to give you um, my little example. I'm just going to stop sharing. So I, these are like my um, examples. So I am a person who really struggles with sleep. I have really, really bad insomnia. And um, now I'm in pre-menopause and I definitely feel a dramatic difference in my sleep habits and COVID just pushed me over the edge. Um, and so I would be up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, sleeping a couple hours. And then finally I was like, why am I beating myself up here? Because I would say to myself, so the record inside my head was saying, well, you're a meditation teacher. You should be able to meditate this. I don't know why you're, you can't sleep. You should be able to mindfully put yourself back to sleep. Uh, none of the strategies I was having was working at all. I would do yoga at night. I would have a bath. You know, everything you could possibly imagine to try to have good sleep hygiene, I tried. And it just wasn't working. So finally, I went to my doctor and I was like, I can't sleep. Uh, and she turned to me and she says, okay. I know you're hesitant about meds, um, but what's worse, not sleeping or taking a bit of meds to help you sleep? And I was like, okay. And I just, I don't know why, I just never gave myself the permission to be imperfect, um, to struggle in a certain way. And ever since I made that choice just to say, screw it, this is what I need. Um, this is what I need in this moment. It totally changed how I feel. So when I wake up now in the middle of the night, I'm totally not bothered by it. I'm just like, you know what? Radical acceptance. It's okay that I um, don't sleep. I've done this a million times. Tomorrow will be just fine. Um, and I try not to watch the clock. I don't get angry anymore. I just kind of go, well, in this moment, this is where I'm at. 
Uh, and <laughs> I know this is not a good sleep hygiene, but I actually listen to podcasts in the middle of the night when I can't sleep because I find if I read, then of course I get into the book. Um, if I look at a screen, of course I've got blue light. So I actually bought myself a pair of sleep headphones <laughs> and uh, I put a timer on my thing and I just like listen and um, I just find it's really soothing for me. So the question of what do I need? I needed to take an action. I needed to ask for help and I needed to soothe myself because what I was doing wasn't working. So I needed new strategies. Okay. So that is that part. Let me see. What else do I want to talk about? Are we into the practice phase? Um, yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to find some soothing phrases, some loving kindness phrases um, that we can speak to ourselves. So when we have a moment of stress, like what is the kryptonite that we can talk about and that will help some of that, right? Um, and so just when you know you found a good phrase, I just want to tell you what it feels like. It'll, it's a space that allows the heart to rest. It's something that you tell yourself that makes you just go, huh. Does that make sense? Um, and as we go into this exercise, the other thing I was going to say is <laughs> a lot of us have a striving problem. So I don't want you to strive in this exercise. I want you to really just think, okay, I'm going to try to think about a few phrases that are going to be helpful for me in difficult times. Um, and I, they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be bang on. I don't have to wordsmith this to get the perfect language. I'm just going to see what this feels like. So any questions before we start? I'm just going to walk you through a bit of an exercise here. But uh, where we'll just close our eyes and just kind of sit with ourselves in a minute. But again, I'm just going to open up the mic and just allow anyone to ask questions or comments. And if there's none, I'm just going to keep going. OK, so I'd ask you to find a comfortable position. Allow your body to rest. Allow the shoulders to drop. Just kind of tune in with the breath. Allow the eyes to close if that feels natural or comfortable to you. I want you just to open up your ear doors and just see what sounds do you hear. Not wanting to push these sounds away, not wanting to make them disappear, just noticing what is radical acceptance. In this moment, I hear this. I want you to tune into the body. Just notice if anything is tight. Notice if there's any pressure around the stomach, the heart. Just allow that pressure to go. Allow the body to settle. Allow the shoulders to drop. Just take a few moments, allow the body to breathe. Breathing in and out. I want you to picture a very good friend of yours in your mind's eye. Notice kind of what your friend is wearing, maybe the kinds of hair they have or a smile. Now you can choose to walk up to this person or to sit next to them at just the right distance. So you're sitting beside your friend. Picture that in your mind. Now your friend beside you knows exactly what's going on for you in your life. They're there for you at all these stages. Now, if your friend could tell you anything right now to soothe you, the inside, what would your friend tell you? Maybe they would say things like, it's okay to make mistakes. Everyone does. Maybe this too shall pass. Or maybe it's something more in the inspiration side. I wish for your happiness. Maybe I, at peace, I want you to be at peace. What would be the phrase that you would want your friend to tell you in this moment? Mm 
what do you need to hear? Maybe you need to have something like, I believe in you, you're a good person, you're doing the best you can. I want things to be fair and just for you. Now I want you to picture your friend next to you as she's saying these things and the type of voice is soft and soothing. And what is it like to be in the presence of your friend? What is it like to hang out with them and breathe in their molecules and just be around them? Feel that warmth, that sense of ease. Just taking a few more breaths. I want you to picture your friend walking away from you. And you're just sitting there in that space, enjoying what just happened, savoring what just happened in the phrases. And I want to remind you that this is the compassionate voice that came from within you. Maybe these phrases that came up for you are the things you deeply need to hear. I want you to say those things to yourself. They came from you. Let them breathe inside you. Tell yourself you're doing the best you can. Things are hard. I'm not alone in my suffering. There's nothing weird, broken, or different. Just feel a sense that you're bringing yourself loving kindness, warmth, phrases, and thoughts, and actions. Like you're filling yourself up with love vibes. Almost like you're breathing in that love, that compassion for yourself. I want you to breathe in three more deep breaths. Just breathing in that compassion and love. And one more breath. And slowly open your eyes. Now, when I do this exercise with teenagers, they always find it really surprising. They think, well, that, that thought came from me <laughs> and maybe I need to hear this more often. So sometimes I want you to notice, so mindfully notice when your thought comes up in your mind of a negative thought or a criticism or, or whatever your greatest hits of difficulty is, and then see if you can pair it with its kryptonite. It's okay. Everyone struggles. You know, I'm, in, I'm perfectly imperfect. As Kristen Neff says, she's like, the goal is to be a compassionate mess. I mean, who hasn't lost their keys or can't find their car in the parking lot? But before I would do that and be like, God, I'm such an idiot. Where am, where's my car? Um, and now I just think about the Seinfeld episode and I just go, yeah, it's part of the human soup and the human experience. And, and sometimes we just, again, forget um, that we're not alone in the suffering. The other thing, I don't know why I really want to talk about this, and I guess it's been a, a request I've had a lot, um, is a lot of people, you know, when you're sitting with somebody who's in deep pain um, and deep suffering, whether it be physical pain, um, whether it be emotional pain. So sitting next to somebody, number one, is often they're, they're suffering. And so they're a little bit prickly on the outside. Um, whether you have a child who's kind of going through difficulty, it's, it's hard to love teens sometimes because they're uh, not always easy. Um, or whether you're, you have a, a family member or a friend who's uh, going through cancer treatments or, or whatever is going on for you. Sitting with suffering is, is not always easy. But when you kind of take care of yourself, you're able to be there more for those difficult times and increasing our, our ability for relationships. Um, I just wanted to kind of take a moment and, and quickly talk that there is a pain that comes from relationships that, you know, when you're suffering, I suffer. And, and that kind of back and forth is that emotions are contagious. 
And so when I have somebody who's really in difficulty, um, what I do is I use a, a specific breath work and it's called one breath for me, one breath for you. And what that one looks like is I picture, so on the side, it picture like a figure eight. So I take a dip breath in, right? And then it comes into me because I need to, like, this is hard, like while I'm watching this. So I take a breath in for me and then they're suffering. So then my figure eight goes out. <sighs> I'm going to give you love. And then I take a breath in and I breathe out for them. So I picture this constant figure eight motion as I breathe. Um, and for those, uh, you know, I, I have not done this, but many of my colleagues that when they sit with somebody who's passing or dying, um, this is the breath work that they use. And I don't know why I've had a lot of people ask me for this one. So I just feel the need just to mention it. You can Google, Google um, affectionate breath or you can Google um, one breath for me, one breath for you. And there's tons of recordings online, like all the MSC stuff, all the recordings, you can find them on YouTube. You can find them on the center's website. Um, they're all publicly available if you need extra meditations. But I just wanted to say that the really the most important thing is to always practice mindfulness and that informal practice is equally as important um, as anything else. So yeah, I see a question about headphones. I'm totally going to get there. I just wanted to, I'll send you the Amazon link. They are the best headphones ever. I love them. Okay. Any other questions? If we have time, I don't know, I have 10 minutes. So I'm like, Ooh, I could squeeze in a couple of one breath for me, one breath for you too. I could also let you go on your day and have a beautiful day. So I don't know what you'd prefer. But I definitely will put my sleep headphones in the chat. I'm just looking them up right now. I'm going to take your silence as you're all really relaxed. <laughs> Thank you for that practice. I just was wondering how you teach your mindful self-compassion to the teens that you work with. Is it like a drop-in club? Is it part of like a health class? How does that work? So um, in the library, I will just do like, um, so what I did this year is I had a big ball of yarn and then uh, I just said, this is what my stress feels like. It just feels overwhelming. And I have like a whole bunch of different colored yarn in it. And I'm like, this is my stress from home. And this is my stress from school. And this is what it feels like. It feels like a tornado inside. And so how do we try to pull this yarn and smooth it out? <laughs> because this isn't easy, things aren't easy. Um, and then I just, I really talk a lot about the vagus nerve. I find um, starting with kids with the vagus nerve is really important um, and going through and just saying, this is what happens in our body and this is the science. So I, I talk a lot about the science and I say, I'm gonna do one, one technique with you. And then I just do one technique a week and it just takes 10 minutes. And so then after that, I just pull the yarn up and then I have a list of all the techniques and I just say, okay, which one of these work for you? Do which one what works and then, okay. And then we're gonna practice the new one today. And I just did that for four weeks, just like 10 minutes at a time. Um, I don't do it too much in class. I do, I, I have done it in the past. It's just, I do it mostly like I try to embed it into my life because I'm like, I like when they arrive, they settle and then we can keep going, right? It, it's, I, I actually use it as a management piece. I'm like, okay, today we're box breathing. Okay, today we're gonna practice like, I call it the vagus nerve rundown where I'm like, relax, 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 relax. Boom, we're done, two breaths, that's it. Because your goal is not to make kids meditators, your goal is to make them open. So yes, okay, sleep headphones. It looks like they're sold out, but I will send the link so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm sure you could find them somewhere else. I found them in several places, but they, it's awesome. My husband's a big fan of them too, <laughs> my sleep headphones. So yes, in the chat, sleep headphones, what they look like. Uh, I'm sure you could find them in a different way. You guys are librarians, are very capable of finding stuff. So yeah, okay, I have 10 minutes. Do you want me to do a five minute, one breath for me, one breath for you, just to finish off the practice today? Sure. Okay. So I just would like you to stay seated. Close your eyes.
I just want you to take a few deep breaths in. And as you breathe in, just want you to tell yourself, I'm doing the best I can. And you're picturing the figure eight breathing into the body. And as you breathe out, I want you to think about somebody in your life that may be struggling right now. And just get that one breath for me, because it's hard to bear witness to struggle. One breath for them. I want you to always remember that you are not the cause of this person's suffering, nor is it in your power to take it away, even if you wish you could. One breath for you, one breath for them. Reminding yourself that you are not the cause of this person's suffering. One breath for me. One breath for you. Just clearly picturing yourself Sometimes I picture myself like a care bear and I'm shooting out love vibes for the other person. But I'm also bringing that love and compassion to myself as I breathe in. One breath for me. One breath for you. Sometimes being in relationship is hard. You should be proud of yourself that you stayed with it and have the space to share one breath for you, one breath for me. Just picturing that figure eight and giving yourself to be imperfect because no relationship is perfect. I want you to really try to expand all parts of the lungs. Breathe in that love for yourself. You're doing the best you can. One breath for them. Everybody struggles. Let's take five more deep breaths in. One breath for me. One breath for you. And slowly coming back to the body in the room, opening your eyes. I just wanna say thank you for joining me today. I will be around for any questions, chats. But my big thing is, is that if you're not a meditator, that's okay. Just even sometimes I'll do one breath for me, one breath for you with my eyes open. When a kid is really sitting there crying with me, I sit and I do one breath for me, one breath for you with kids at school. And do you know what's interesting is that, you know, when you're sitting in a presence with somebody who, you know, you're, you're being deeply listened to and deeply heard and seen. I just find that one breath for me, one breath for you allows me to occupy that space more easily. Um, and I'm not as quick to answer or to judge or to respond, but just to be with what is, to hold that experience in a loving, compassionate way. And kids are just drawn to that like a moth to a flame because you're a safe place. Um, and once you start holding experience in this way, people tell you all sorts of things. I don't even know how many times a week people will look at me and say, I don't, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I'm like, I don't know why either. Um, but I know it's because I'm a safe place to land. Okay. 
So yeah. So any questions, comments, you know, I always love it. Otherwise, I release you on your day. Please take care of yourself. Oh, recommend books, apps, website. Totally. Um, so I, if you're wanting, ever wanting to take the course, if you want to start this journey, um, I would recommend um, the self-compassion course. Uh, so for me, my union, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but my union pays for the course because teachers are stressed out. We're caregivers um, and we have something called caregiver burnout um, because we give all day and then there's nothing left for us, right? Uh, so I put it into the chat. This is the short course. It's uh, just over, I think, 200 and something dollars, um, but it's a short, week, a short six week course. Uh, love it. So that's my teacher there. If you're wanting more, you just go to the Center of Mindful Self-Compassion. There's tons. Um, there's books. Chris Germer's got a great book. Um, Kristen Neff's got a great book. Uh, Fierce Self-Compassion just came out. There's workbooks as well. I mean, I've got my huge pile of stuff over here. But yeah, there's there's a million things. If you type in mindful self-compassion meditations um, on the center, they're all the recordings are there. If you want it like long, beautiful, juicy ones of like 45 minutes. Um, but just know that anything that you do that's taking care of yourself, whether you're in action to say no and boundaries, or whether you're there to soothe and calm your nervous system because it's been a hard day. You know, all things are good. Okay. Um I, do you want me to type in the this MSC website? I can do that as well. I think what what I why I think it, this stuff really landed for me is because it is so science based, um, and you know you, you, I can do this in um, all sorts of different kinds of settings. Um, I, I've done it for oh, the type of people I've presented to. Oh, I've done it for um, Aboriginal group uh, foster care homes. I've done it um, for super anxious teens. Uh, I've talked to biologists at the biology center in Nanaimo. Um, yeah, because it is so uh, part of it. Huh. Oh yeah, thank you. It's on the app, um, on the time timers. Thank you. For it. There's more people answering on the chats too, lovely. And then there's the center for MSC. Yeah, anything else you guys need? Happy to chat. And Morgan totally do the course. It was great. My husband did it twice too. Not at the same time. <laughs> we did them separately. Dominique, can you talk about the vagus nerve? Just mm. a quick little... Sure. So uh, you've got the amygdala, obviously your fight, flight, or freeze center here, and then it's got the, the, like feelers. So the there's two different uh, cranial nerves. The first cranial nerve, the tenth one, is the face. So it has three points: the eyes, the ears, um, and the jaw. So basically, think about it this way: if you're like this, like what is this vagus nerve telling your freakout center? I'm afraid. I'm scared. Right. And so these all trigger on a biological center on how we are. So if I, in Buddhism, we call it smiling eyes, or if we're clenching our jaw, we're angry, right? We're telling our amygdala, I'm not safe. And there's a reason why music makes us feel good because the vagus nerve goes into the middle ear. So I always say, listen, relax, relax. So that's the face. And then the a 12th, vein, a 12th cranial nerve comes out of the back of the spine. It comes across the throat. So that's why singing feels good. That's why chanting is so important. So it's, you know what I mean? Because you're, you're screaming if you're afraid and that tells your, your brain to be afraid. So if we relax, it tells relax, right? Um, so then it goes through the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the digestive systems, like the, and right down to the bum. So basically, a, I call it a vagus nerve rundown. I just say, okay, I teach one breath, relax this, take another breath, relax this. I go, and I just point to the different spots and it takes two breaths, just chill it out. And then it's telling the brain, uh, relax, everything's chilled, uh, rest and digest happening down here. No need to freak out. Yeah. That's what the vagus nerve is in a very short <laughs> conversation. But if you just type in vagus nerve images, show a picture of that and just say, see everything that's attached to, it tells our amygdala to freak out. We're gonna use our bodies 
to turn it down because it's easier to use our bodies than it is to tell our brains, you need to calm down. Because remember in the history of calm down, when does it has ever worked when someone says, you need to calm down? <laughs> that doesn't work. I find going through the body um, way easier. Thanks so much for that information. Oh, I pleasure. Super great. Like I said, I just have a big ball of yarn and I put up a picture of vagus nerve and then I just say, chill this, two breaths. And then next week we do box breathing. And then I say, okay, uh, now we have two strategies in our toolkit. We have box breathing in Vegas, practice one of them, cool. And then here's your third week, here's a new one. I, and then feet on the ground or like whatever. But I try to make them very subtle. The, the first couple I do when I do with kids, I make them very subtle. Like I just say, you know what? I'm doing it right now. Can you tell? And I just say, you can do this in class. It's a strategy that no one around you will know. It's very private and is very effective. So, yeah. Other questions? I hope you have delicious lunches prepared and that you're going to be taking care of yourselves and eating fabulously. Uh, I have a leftover taco from taco night, so that's what I'm going to eat. But otherwise, I wish you just the greatest day. And I just think teacher librarians are so needed and we need you to do your work. And so the first things first is we need you to take care of yourselves. <laughs>